Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I know. I've been licking my wound since last night too. It'll be okay. It'll be fine. Hallelujah. You got your Bibles? Possibly for the last time for a while, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. I can't help it. I got to do it. But I do feel like the Lord has directed my heart for this, for us to come to knowledge regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If there's ever a day we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's today. Amen, Brother Nolan. You got that right. Say that again, brother. If there's ever a time we needed the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's now. Amen. You can see this is interactive. This is better than the internet. This is better than those 3D games that you put funky things on your face and look weird. It's amazing what we'll do to entertain ourselves. But I believe with all my heart, if ever there was a time we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's now. It's today. It's 2024. It's not last year or the years before. It's not even so much about tomorrow as much as it is about today. I can't operate off of a spiritual blessing from tomorrow. I need what God offers today. Give us this day our daily bread. There's more to that than just a slice of a loaf. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2 verse 1, if you got it, say amen. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly, suddenly, without warning, without so much as the hint of something about to take place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Oh God, that you would do that again. The only thing that ever fills this house up is when the train goes by. Amen. God, give us a sound that comes from heaven that doesn't have a thing to do with the Norfolk Southern. Somebody say amen. Preach on. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all, not some, not a majority, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God, help me. I pray, God, Lord, as I did up on the mountain, God, hide me behind the cross. Cover me with your blood. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon me and upon this message and upon every person that hears it, whether here live or whether they're watching live stream or whether they're watching the rebroadcast. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, let every person be anointed to hear it, to receive it, and then, Father God, to operate therein. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said... Amen and amen. It doesn't take long for us to take a quick glance at the text that reveals to us about the book of Acts and how that what took place on the day of Pentecost didn't stop in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. For some people, it's as if when you get through with verse 4, as the Spirit gave them utterance, period. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing more. Nothing going on here, nothing to see here. Move along, move along. Well, honey, I don't believe that. And I'm here to tell you that for way too many Pentecostals, it has become all too apparent that it does for them. They think it stops there. I'm here to tell the Russellville Church of God. I'm here to tell those that are watching by live stream, and I know there are many that are watching in different states around the place. Some of them know me personally. Some of them are family. Some of them just happen to walk by their internet. Hey, how did that get on there? Don't change the channel. God's got something to say to you. Amen. Let me just see if maybe this fits your particular experience. At some point in your life, you became convicted of your sins and you desired to be saved. You desired salvation from God. Somebody, somewhere, some way, somehow, helped you at that point to find your way to the path that led you to Calvary, brought you to the place where you found there at the cross Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Somebody helped you to continue along in that journey. And in the process, you may have joined yourself to a group of believers or 
become a member of a particular church. You continued along that journey. You even went so far as following Jesus Christ in water baptism so that you could fulfill all righteousness. And then you heard about another experience. You heard about something going on that came from God and you began to seek for that Pentecostal experience and before you knew it, there, I got it. Have to get it dry enough. It's moist up here. It happened. It happened. I mean, suddenly it happened. It wasn't something that you knew when you walked in the church you were growing to gradually work into. Suddenly, while you were praying, suddenly while you were singing, suddenly while you were worshiping, it began to happen to you. Heaven seemed to open up for you. The Bible seemed to suddenly become alive and living in you. You felt a rush in your being like you've never felt before. Your hands were lifted up. Tears may have streamed down your face. Your lips began to quiver and stammer and the next thing you knew there were words coming out of your mouth, you didn't have a clue what they were, what kind of a language it was, what part of the world it came from, but they came out of you just as much as you opened your mouth, that much more seemed to flow out. And you begin to wonder, is this the experience that I have been seeking for? I want to go on record and say, yep. I want you to know and understand, praise God, the Lord has just blessed you with this glorious experience that he promised would take place when Pentecost was poured out. And I'm here to tell you, people, probably if you were in a service like I was, begin to shout and begin to rejoice and begin to proclaim, that's it. You've got it. You've got the Holy Ghost. Amen. But now what? What are you supposed to do after this? Okay, you got that feel-good experience all over. Your goosebumps have got goosebumps. Your hair won't lay down on your back or for the men either. I'm going to get you to smile one way or the other. You might as well just go ahead and jump in. You got to the place, friend, where you never felt like this before and it felt real good. What are you supposed to do now? We're almost like Wile E. Coyote who chased that stinking roadrunner up one road and down another, fell off cliffs, got smashed, got stomped, got blowed up, you name it, he had it done to him. And finally they made a cartoon and Wiley finally caught the roadrunner and once he had him in clutch with one hand, he took a sign and held up and said, okay, now what do I do with him? You wanted me to catch him, what do I do now? And some of us are like Wile E. Coyote. We finally received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and we don't know what we're supposed to do now. We know it felt good. We knew we never felt anything like that before. But what do we do now? Well, we've told folks a lot of things and most of those things were good. We tell folks like just rejoice and let it soak in. Good, good advice. Pray every day. Read your Bible every day and so on. And so on, but then you begin to think, wait, I was doing that before. You mean this is it? I'm going to go on record and say, no, this is not it. The question here is, is there more to this glorious experience than what I've had? Yes, the answer must be struck out there. We absolutely must need to know that it doesn't end with Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, that God's got more for us, and we just need to talk to him a little bit about it, see what's going on. Let me share some misinformation with you about this glorious experience. And folks, let me tell you, there's been a lot of it, and it's not all necessarily been outside the church. Some well-meaning folks have shared some things that just simply are not biblically true. They're not scripturally correct. You need to know and understand, first of all, that that abuse of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and speaking more so about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, has absolutely been with us for a long time. In fact, a little over 1,900 years it's been with us. Even people of that day got messed up and mixed up and meant well, but the truth of the matter is they didn't know what they were talking about. I've had people try to explain things to me spiritually speaking without any scriptural reference or backing. And I'm here to tell you, you need to be careful. You need to be careful. If what it sounds like sounds too good to be true, it probably is. 
What you need to do is you need to open your Bible, open up your Bible. He said, open up your Bible, stick your finger, your nose, or whatever in there, and read on until you find what God is showing you. And friend, if you don't know how to circumnavigate the Bible, then may I encourage you, come to Sunday school. Come on, Brother Don, you should have shouted loudest right then and there. Come to Sunday school. You need to be in the house of God learning the word of God. Oh, I'm just too tired, Pastor. I'm just too tired. I, I got somebody in church today didn't think he was going to be here. He was wore out last night and especially at midnight when our favorite team decided to fold up and move out. He's been on the road all week long, over 2,000 miles, traveled all over the place here in eastern, northeastern Tennessee and western North Carolina, but he's in the house of God today. And I'm here to tell you, I understand tired. I get it. And at 6 o'clock when my alarm woke, woke me up, one of the rare times that my alarm clock went, I'm usually ahead of my alarm clock by about an hour. But I was tired when I got up, but I said, this is Sunday. This is the day for the house of the Lord. And not because, quote, unquote, I have a job to do, but rather yet, I want to be in the house of God. It's strange for me to not be in the house of God. I don't like to go on vacation because more times than not, I can't find a place on a boat to be able to find a church service someplace. And I'll even find somebody that's got their Bible open sitting in a coffee shop someplace on the ship. And I've been very tempted, hey, do you mind if I join you? I've I've missed some fellowship with the saints of God. I've met some wonderful people, some glorious people, some brothers and sisters I didn't even know existed on a boat. Imagine how Jesus felt meeting people on a boat. All they could do was complain, don't you care that we're about to die? Wake up. Oh, poor Jesus. Can't even catch a nap. Let me tell you, here's about four things that you need to understand. Number one, you need to understand that the Holy Spirit is not an it. I'm going to say that again. The Holy Spirit is not an it. Brother Thorne can tell you we've changed the words on a particular song. We used to sing, send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. I, it, oh, it just flew through me. Maybe I got that from Steve Holder. I don't know. But we change it. We say, send him on down. Send him on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Somebody say amen. I'm here to tell you, the Holy Spirit's not an it. He is he, him, his. He is the third person of the Godhead. The Bible says in 1 John 5 and 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, namely the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. It's hard for us to, to imagine that concept. And even the very things that we come up with to try to explain the Trinity just fall short because it's physical things, material things, earthly things. When we get to heaven, I don't know how it's going to happen, but we're going to see the Father, and we're going to see the Son, and we're going to see the Holy Spirit, and we're going to go, oh, I get it now. I don't understand how, but it's going to take place. And I'm cool with that. There are some things I get just like that. And the, that didn't work either. I'll try the other side later. But the fact of the matter is that, friend, there are some things I grasp real quick. And there are some things that God's saying to you, I don't need to explain this. I don't need to put this through a process. I don't need to get your You just need to accept by faith what I've shared with you. And the Trinity is one of those things you need to accept by faith. Somebody said, oh, you're worshiping three gods. No, I am not. I'm worshiping one God who has revealed himself to me as Father, Spirit, and the Son. And the fact of the matter, he's done that for our purposes, not his. Amen. He knows who he is. He knows what he can do, praise God. Somebody came along and said, well, you know, I've dealt with folks and they have a problem with father figures. So I tell them to call upon God as mother. Well, you know what? This book says don't do that. This book says don't do that. This book says to call him father. Jesus said when you pray, pray it like this. Our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Who are we to think we can change that direction down here because somebody had a bad situation? And friend, I'm not putting down folks who've gone through bad situations, but I'm telling you we don't have the right to change the personality nor the way that we approach God. He is God the Father. Hallelujah. Your daddy wasn't no good. Get a hold of Jesus, his daddy. His daddy's real good. Somebody say amen. Preach on, Brother Nolan. The Holy Spirit, being the third person of the Godhead, is equal with the Father and the Son. There isn't no placement of priority or importance. God, the Holy Spirit, is just as important as the Son and the Father. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. We're not doing any detriment to Him. In all fairness, to well-meaning believers, when they say you've got it, the it that they're referring to is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit himself. The Holy Spirit is not a messenger for your personal convictions. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble. You right? Y'all recording, right? So, okay, we'll make sure. Some believers have gone to the extreme by giving a message in tongues and then follow it up with an interpretation that supports their personal convictions. Can I tell you if the Holy Spirit came down with a message, number one, he's got a reason for coming in and interrupting that service with a message in tongues. And the last thing he's going to do is support what you believe. Dear sister, every time there was a message in tongues, it didn't matter what was going on, what was taking place, the, the interpretation would always be, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Wonderful scripture, true scripture, nothing wrong with that scripture. But I find it hard to believe that God would come down in a service, break into that service, disrupt whatever was going on for the express purposes of telling that, that scripture again. And Is that scripture true? Yes, that scripture is true. But friend, if God's going to take the time to come in, he's going to take the time to read your mail. That's M-A-I-L. He's going to take the time to tell you he knows where you're at, what you're going through, what you're dealing with, and what you need to do to stop dealing with that. I don't understand why some folks can't have, have that understanding about them. Too many folks who speak these words, thus says the Lord, they've done it when God hasn't spoken to them or through them. And I don't know, but they're, they're not dangerously close to blaspheming and using his name in vain. Oh, man, he, he's hard. What did they do to him on that mountain? I saw a house that looked like a flying saucer. I had some folks on my vehicle want to make sure that the drugs that had been taken hadn't backed up on them or something there. The Holy Spirit, listen to me, he's never going to share any thing that ever goes against or cannot be supported by this blessed holy Bible. You hear me? I've heard some people give some interpretations of messages that absolutely, I'm like, now, now wait a minute. The Bible says this. I, I confess, I, I'm not like Tim Hill or Mark Williams or, or Brother Lipsy or, or any of those other people that some of y'all saw this past week or in times gone by. I, I don't have that kind of memory. Somebody said, well, do you not have photographic memory? I said, no, I ran out of film. So I can't photograph it very well. But I do know this, when I put the word of God in me, the Holy Spirit brings the word of God out in through me, amen, so that I can stand, praise God, on solid ground. And too many people want to, yea, thus saith the Lord, and they don't have an idea what thus saith the Lord is or what it is he's trying to say. Third thing you need to take note of is the Holy Spirit is not just a super discharge for our emotions. Now look. It is an emotional demonstrative thing that takes place when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All of a sudden, you'll get a jerk, you know, or whatever. You'll, you'll kick up high one side or the other. God help you if you go both at the same time. You better be holding on to something or you better know that the Holy Ghost is holding you up. Somebody say amen. Be like that fellow I heard about, the Holy Spirit moved upon him. He got to running around the church. Next thing they knew, he ran outside and ran up, ran all the way to the top of a, of a great big thorn tree. Got up there to the top of the tree and the spirit anointing left him. He didn't have a clue in the world how to come down. 
not without great pain and anguish. Sometimes we allow ourselves to emotionally get ourselves in a position where we shouldn't be. Friend, God's not against your emotion. God's not against your body responding to him as he moves within your being. But friend, make sure it's him and not you. Somebody preach on, why don't you now? Amen. The, more to the Pentecostal experience than an emotional reaction or an outward demonstration of the presence of God. There is always purpose, I'm going to say it again, always purpose in the demonstration of the power of God. God doesn't waste his power. Too many are overly spiritual about things that don't require spirituality to function. I had a lady that would tell me on Monday, Lord, you want me to do my laundry today or you want me to wait for a better appointed time? I looked at her. I said, seriously? She goes, yes. I don't do anything without talking to the Lord. I get the concept and the principle. But if you're going to have clean clothes, you better do your laundry. You better pick a day and do your laundry on that day. And if you need to interrupt it, God will help you. He'll either extend the day for you or he'll let you clothes go one extra day while you do the laundry the next day. Same person used to say, God, you want me to take a bath? I'm praying, God, please answer that in the affirmative. The Bible says if you're going to have friends, you've got to be friendly. The friendliest thing you can do is take a bath. Amen. I went by a brother up there on a the mountain. I thought, man, you just need, it's not so much a bath. You just, deodorant would be nice. Hallelujah. I believe you know Lazarus, don't you? He stunketh too. Don't look at me like that. Y'all are, I can't believe that. You know what I'm talking about. Walking down Walmart, somebody comes along by you and the, the odor alone is enough to cause the cheese to curdle. There are certain things that God's given you common sense to know what to do. I messed up the other day coming to church. I looked down. My gas hand was on empty. I started praying. I said, God, I don't know if I've got enough to get to the church or not. But God, if you'll let me, help me. Don't let that gas hand move, God. Keep the gas in my tank. Now, he didn't fill my tank up. He didn't say, you poor stupid idiot. I'm just gonna fill your tank up. But God sustained my gas because guess what else I forgot? I forgot to stop on my way home. The Lord was gracious to me. I went the next day. First thing I did before I did anything else, I went and filled it up. Why? Because... I didn't want to feel that way about me again. Amen. And that's the way we are, saints. Just let's admit it. Amen. Sometimes we just get going, get going, get going, and God bestows grace upon us far, far greater than we can imagine. If the only time that you ever discern that the Holy Spirit is on you or in you or operating through you, then because you've got an emotional discharge, please don't misunderstand. I, I got no problem with people who get the jerks or who dance or whatever the case may be. I got no problem with that. That's not what this is about. But if that's the only time that the Holy Spirit ever moves upon you when you do any of that, you need to ask yourself the question, just how mature am I in Christ? I mean, I can be mature in the Lord and not have to do all that. Do I like it when it happens? Yeah, glory I do. I love it when the Holy Spirit moves upon me and I begin to speak in a foreign language that I know I haven't studied. I get really excited when God moves upon me and speaks to me a language that I know is an existing language upon this planet somewhere, but I don't know that. I've told you before, we were in Southeast Alaska up there during a camp meeting and I started praying for a sister there. She was a clinkin' Indian. As I began to pray for her, I started going click, clack, click, clack, tick, tock, tick, tock. That's the best I can do. I don't know what I said to her. After the service is over, she comes up to me. She says, I didn't know you knew how to speak clink it. She said, you're pretty good for a white guy. I said, I didn't know I knew how to speak clink it either. She said, you've got to be kidding. I was up there in the altar and you prayed for me. I said, I remember. I was there. She said, you spoke perfect clinket. You didn't speak it with, a, with an accent that most white people have. She said, you spoke it like you were born here. I said, honey, you heard the Holy Ghost. In the church there in Anchorage, I was praying for someone. And as I prayed for them, brother sitting about where brother Gary's at, looked around at his children and said, listen, listen, the Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit speaks. And they said, 
Daddy, that's, that's Brother Nolan. He's praying for someone through the Spirit. He said, no, he's speaking perfect Castilian Spanish. I haven't heard that since my mother and my father passed away. His parents were Spanish, moved to Mexico. He grew up speaking Tex-Mex. It's different from Castilian Spanish. He said, oh, listen, listen to that. And he began to weep and he began to worship because he heard the Holy Spirit giving somebody he knew couldn't hardly do much more than go, okay. No habla espanol, senor or senorita. I'm telling you, God has a way. If only though, the only time is when you have an emotional discharge like that, then honey, you need to grow up. You need to move from goo goo ga ga to letting the Holy Spirit use communicational language through you, whether it's English or Spanish or German. I'll throw, I'll throw that one in there while I was at it too. Or Hawaiian or whatever the case may be. You need to grab a hold of the fact that, friend, God knows every language. There is no language he doesn't know. The Holy Spirit, fourth of all, is not limited to the structure of this building. I'm going to say it again. The Holy Spirit is not bound by the structure or limited to the structure of this building. In other words, preacher, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you he works better outside sometimes than he does inside. Are you hearing me? Notice, if you will, the church services are not to only be here on the platform for ministry to the community. If all we ever do is just preach about it from here, we are a poor, poor example of God's church. But when the church steps out away from the pulpit, when the church gets out of the seats, when the church comes out of the classroom, when the church comes out of the fellowship hall, when the church goes into the world and begins to share the love of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that's been poured out upon them and fill them up on the inside, honey, God begins to do some things like you ain't never seen before. You understand that the church, if you could say it this way, in the upper room, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, is where they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's Acts chapter 2 verse 5 where the action starts taking place. Oh, it was good inside the church, and it needs to be good inside the church. The worship needs to be good. The music needs to be good. The preaching needs to be good. The praying needs to be good. But honey, for it to be real good, what we get on the inside needs to be marched out the doors and shared with everybody on the outside. Somebody say amen. amen. Notice what chapter two and verse five tells us. It tells us the location of the devout Jews were not in the upper room. The location of the devout Jews was outside the upper room throughout the city of Jerusalem. And God brought them together outside that room so that Peter could stand up under the anointing and say, these ain't drunk like you suppose. They're just filled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. And he began to preach. And honey, how he did preach. And when he got through, 3,000 of the people that had gathered around out there gave their heart to the Lord and became converted. Good stuff. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the final spiritual achievement. You cannot say, I have finally arrived, Shibaba Itaye. That's me making that up. If all you got out of this was to speak in some foreign language, you missed it. You missed it. Just because you get the jerking fits or you dance a jig in one spot or maybe you like that little wind-up toy that used to go. You know what I'm talking about? Might as well get you a symbol. Remember that monkey? We thought that was so funny. Didn't last long, but some of us have still got a working model from back in the day. That bad boy's worth some money. Little monkey. Some of us do the same thing. Unless I'm slain in the spirit, I haven't been in church. Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble. 
We come to church expecting God to do the same thing the same way every time we come to church. Let me tell you something. God's not going to do that. God don't want it to become old hat for you. God wants you to have a fresh experience. Maybe you'll dance this time. Maybe you'll run the aisles. God, give us runners. How I miss runner Bob. He's with the Lord now. I'm assuming he comes through every once in a while. Some of y'all know who I'm talking about. Runner Bob, when the Holy Ghost would move, he'd take off. Nothing wrong with those outward expressions. Not a thing in the world. But if that's all you come to church for is that, you're missing the mark. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall run around in circles. You shall dance a jig in a little circle by yourself. You shall just speak in tongues and nobody will understand you. No, no, no. You shall receive power to do what? To be witnesses of him, about him, unto him. Preach on. Can I tell you, if anything, when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we've passed through a gate into a new arena of spirituality with God. And the whole purpose is that God might reveal the mysteries of his holy word to us. There's nothing I enjoy better, not a thing in the world I enjoy better, than whenever I read scripture and I go, wait a minute, what? And I read it again and all of a sudden, he pulls the blinders from my eyes. He pulls back the shades. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And he illuminates that scripture to me in such a way, there's no doubt, I have seen something I haven't seen before. And I always love, I run into somebody, oh yeah, I knew that all. I don't like you. I just found out about it. It's exciting to me. It's wonderful to me. It's like finding out what some of those buttons on your car are all about. Amen? Got one on mine that says eco. I'm still not sure I know what it is, but every once in a while it gets pushed. And when it does, the car reacts differently. Don't look at me like that. I found another button that locks all the windows. If I don't want somebody playing with the windows going up and down the road, I push the lock button. Ain't nobody touching that window except me. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, that's just, that's the, it's been there. It was manufactured and put in there. Friend, it's in here. God manufactured it and put it in here. We just haven't seen the revelation of that word yet. But when we do, it's like on Wednesday night in the men's meeting. Brother Don, can you, you and, and, and brother, uh, brother, that guy right there, brother Roger, hallelujah, I get so excited sometimes. We, we get to hearing things and seeing things and, and things that have been there. It's not like it's not been there. It's been there all along. But all of a sudden we read it. And I, I love it when you do it, brother Don. You share some scripture and when you do, my goodness gracious, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can take on the world now. Come on, Don, let's go. Hallelujah. It's awesome. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it in the world than to have God's word suddenly revealed to you. Can you imagine what those two fellows must have thought on the road to Emmaus as they are talking about the death of Jesus and how it's coming to an end and Jesus comes up and says, hey, what y'all talking about? You just get into town, you hadn't heard what they'd done to Jesus of Nazareth? No, tell me. And so they go, oh, it's terrible. They killed him. They put him on a cross. They crucified him. They buried him and now his body's missing. And the Bible says he took the scriptures and began to show them from what we would call the Old Testament through the prophets and the law, the things that he had to go through. And friend, their eyes were bugged out. Their minds were being blown and they got to the place where they're going to stop for the night and Jesus acted as if, He was going to go on. Won't you stay? We'll buy. We'll buy supper if you stay. Okay. So he stayed and he kept talking and they gave their order from the menu. And when the food was brought out, Jesus said, why don't we pray? And he began to pray over it. And all of a sudden, their eyes got opened. And they realized who it was. And they looked at him in almost stark unbelief, if you can say it that way. I don't know if that's the right what it said or not. And he disappeared. Did you see that? Yes. Oh, my heart's on fire. Oh, my soul is on fire. Oh, I, you know, that was Jesus. And the Bible said they ran back that same hour. 
I've read it several times. You can tell me I've misinterpreted it. I, I can handle that. But I like the way I've interpreted it. They ran back in the same hour, the direction and the time and the distance it took them all day to walk. Can, it, can, can I, You talk about the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah to God. Friend, they, they had a spiritual move going on and they went back to the house where they were gathered together. We've seen him. We've talked with him. We've seen Jesus. My God, I would, I could get some people in this church who would get a vision of Jesus Christ and get turned loose amongst the rest of us so that we could absolutely have a great time in the Lord. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this house for that. I gotta hurry. We must not become satisfied with mediocrity. I'm going to say it again. We must not become satisfied with mediocrity. One of the greatest obstacles that have come upon us for modern day Pentecostals is becoming baptized in lethargy. Now that sounds, you know, almost religious, doesn't it? Lethargy, doxology, and all of the other OG wise. And we need to be careful because lethargy will settle in real quick. Merriam Webster defined it this way to be lethargic is defined as having abnormal drowsiness. Me, about three o'clock in the afternoon. You don't have to say amen. To be apathetic, sluggish, or coldly indifferent. And I got to tell you, lethargy in a Pentecostal is deadly. You hear me? It's deadly. Lethargy takes people who are spirit-filled and on fire. They're overcomers through Jesus Christ. They are tongue talkers. They testify. They can't wait for church to come together so that the believers in them can have a great time in the Lord. It reduces them, though, to become passionless, powerless, painless, pointless, and pathetic Pentecostals of mediocrity. God, don't let us get lethargic. Somebody say amen. God didn't save us and sanctify us and fill us with a Holy Spirit and fire so that we could become lost in a building on Sundays and just meander our way through life. Preach, Brother Nolan. Oh, I'm going to, but I am bringing it to a close. Jerry Vines, I'm sure you know him. If some of you are former Baptists, you would recognize his name. He used to be the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. I quote him. He said, the average Christian and average churches are bogged down somewhere between Calvary and Pentecost. I remind you, this is the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, that modern day average churches, and unfortunately believers as well, are caught somewhere bogged down, he said, quoting him directly, between Calvary and Pentecost. Imagine that, a Baptist saying something so Pentecostal. But it's true. Now, I'm sure he was talking about the Southern Baptist churches. Or maybe he was talking about Baptist churches as a whole. And I guarantee you, some of that jump up and say, oh, bless God, you've never been to this missionary Baptist church. You've never been to this primitive Baptist church. You've never been to this independent Baptist church. You know, we go down this list, and I'm sure there are those that are excluded from that. But the reality and the truth is, overwhelmingly and alarmingly, too many of the average brothers and sisters in the Lord and the average churches are caught between Calvary and Pentecost. Let me, let me bring it down a little bit further. For us as believers, we need to remember, number one, that Bethlehem means God is with us. We celebrate it every December. We call it Christmas. And before you get real spiritual on me and try to explain to me that Christmas, the time we celebrate the birth of Christ, really didn't happen in December, I know. Can you imagine them singing, I'm dreaming of a Sultry Christmas, burning my flesh outside today. Where's the sunblock, honey? Another glass of water. Hello. 
just doesn't work, does it? Calvary means God is for us. And surely as Christmas comes along to tell us that God is with us, Calvary comes along, Easter, Resurrection Day, I like to refer to it as, that God is for us. Jesus didn't go to that cross for himself. Think about that. He did not allow himself to go to that old rugged cross. Amen? For himself, he went there Ooh. Ooh. And then third of all, Pentecost comes along. And why we as Pentecostals don't celebrate this better, but Pentecost means that God is in us. And folks, Pentecost is for everything in between Christmas and Easter, or in some folks' case, between Easter and Christmas. In other words, Pentecost is for all the other times. Two days out of every year we celebrate the resurrection and we celebrate the birth. But there ought to be 363 and a quarter days where we're celebrating the fact that the Holy Spirit is alive and well and dwelling in the hearts of believers and absolutely has got us turned on to do the work of the kingdom of God. If we truly believe then what I've just shared, then great things are going to happen. Why? Because there will be outward demonstrations of God's power with purpose in us, individually as well as corporately. If we truly believe this, then preaching will be with power and with anointing. If we truly believe this, then churches are going to respond accordingly. Instead of Sleepily. Sleep. Hope I didn't just make that word up. If we truly believe this, the church and the kingdom of God will grow. Not because we've learned some fancy damn way to do certain things to attract, you know, we, we got to do something to attract new people. How about we just live for the Lord? Let's start with that and work our way from there. Well, if we could get, you know, some smoke machines and get smoke to come off, that works great at Easter or at uh, Halloween. I know, we like the church I used to pastor in Hawaii where they actually brought a disco ball on the inside and aimed a big spotlight at it and they caused it to spin and brilliant lights all over the creation. They also had orgies in the church, but that's not what God's called us to do. Miracles, signs, and wonders, if we truly believe this, are going to be experienced. People's backs are going to get healed. People's coughing is going to get healed. I know you're wanting that so bad. She's so tired of sucking on, on honey and lemon cough drops. Come on. If we truly believe this, God's going to move amongst us and some of our aches and our pains and our hips and our knees and our elbows and our shoulders and our necks are going to go away. Why? Not because we die, but because the Lord is doing something specific in us. We'll start living beyond Acts 2 and 5 all the way to glory if we'll really believe this. And this is what I want you to hear. Verse 39. You don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. You do not have biblical grounds for not receiving Verse 39, for this promise is to you and to your children and to them that are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. And Peter preached that under the anointing of God and as he did so, the Bible says in verse 40, with many other words, he testified and he exhorted them saying, be saved. Oh Lord, you sure he's not talking about today? Be saved from this perverse generation. Those who gladly received his word were baptized and there, that day about 3,000 souls were added to them and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers and then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common. 
And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness. You ever been out to eat with me? I don't eat sad. Hello, I ain't happy. Ooh, finally it came out. Ooh, yours looks good. You want to share? Stingy. They shared their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, listen, the Lord added daily. Oh, dear Lord, wouldn't it be awesome, Sister Janie, we come in on a Monday, and it's not so much about taking care of the business aspect of the church, but welcoming somebody through the doors who wants to come to church here. Wouldn't it be great on Tuesday? I get a phone call and says, are you the pastor at the Russellville Church? God, yeah, I got some folks here that need to come in and pray. Is there any way you can be there? Yeah, give me 25 minutes. Unless the Lord sends me a tornado picks me up and just drops me off over there in the next couple of minutes, I'll be there in 25. I could go on through the rest of the days. You understand what I'm saying? Daily, daily, daily God adds to the church. Are you ready? Because he just doesn't bring people in to, if you'll pardon the expression, sponge off of us. But they want to get saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Oh, thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so pure and free. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us. I don't want to stop living at Acts 2 and 4. I want to pick up at Acts 2 and 5. Be a witness to those around us those around us, oh God, Lord, who, Father God, Lord, are the kind of people that are close to you but need a little bit more closeness. Those, oh God, Lord, who haven't yet come to the saving knowledge of you and yet God, Jesus Christ, died for them. I pray, God, Lord, help us, Father, that from Acts chapter 2, verse 5 going forward, we become that church. We become that people. We become that person you need us to be so that others can be added to the church daily. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you have a need from the Lord, you couldn't be in a better place. FEMA doesn't have a place that you could be at that would be better than this. Lions Club and the Kiwanis and others like them, their meeting halls just ain't good enough for what God's got in store for you here. Wonderful people, nice folks, but they don't have what we're proclaiming to you today. And that is whatever you're facing, you don't have to face it alone. You don't have to go through the decision process alone. God will help you. God will walk with you. God will show you the steps to take. God will show you what you should say, what you shouldn't say, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. Why? Because he loves you. He cares about you. So if you've got a need today, whether spiritual, physical, financial, family, whatever, he can handle it. And nothing can make this preacher a whole lot happier than to be able to pray with you and believe God together for your need. I'm just going to wait just a few seconds while God speaks to your heart one more time. Father, in the name of Jesus, I trust you. I pray this prayer, God, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ for the sake 
of those nearby us who have gone through hell on earth. Never dreamed that that much water could fall and then come together and then absolutely demolish and destroy like it has. In places, oh God, Lord, that some of us still cannot get it through our heads how in the mountains could something like this happen. I pray in the name of Jesus, touch and minister. Minister to every single person and every family, God, that's going through this nightmare and help them comfort and console those who have lost family members and friends. Help communities that are having to deal with washed out roads and washed away bridges with water systems that are still not functioning, power systems that are still dead. Help us, God. Get our politics out of the way and help us, God, Lord, to shoulder together, lift together, and do together what it's going to take to bring these communities back. I trust you, Lord. I may not understand everything, but I trust you. And I know that you'll see us through this because the church is at its best when Satan is at his worst. And I pray, God, Lord, let your love be experienced throughout this region. I pray in Jesus' name. Father, keep us, everyone, safe until we come together at the appointed hour. Lord, I ask you, God, Lord, just keep us, Father God, in your perfect care and bring us all back at the appointed hour. In Jesus' this wonderful name we pray, and everybody said amen. We have a video to show you tonight that uh, has been made available to show us uh, recent updates. Uh, we have service tonight at 6. Try it. You might like it. Amen. It beats anything on TV, that's for sure. That's a fact. Amen. Love you, bless you, see you, bye you, peace out.